Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nikki. I'm Head of Learning at Nosley Safari, which is in Liverpool in the UK. Um, and I'm going to be talking about how we incorporated education um, when we built our new Tiger Trail exhibit. Um, that opened May last year. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background to it, um, we are a safari park. So originally, our tigers were on our safari drive part of, of our experience. The new tiger trail that we have is in our foot safari or in our area that is more like a traditional zoo. So we had a few problems with the old um, tiger um, area. Excuse the poor quality of the picture. It's just ones that we could gather together at last minute. So the first problem was there was a poor guest experience. Although the tigers were on the safari drive, they were in a drive pass rather than a drive-through exhibit. And also, tigers are, of course, very elusive, and ours weren't that keen on being seen by visitors. So for every 10 times or so you'd go around the drive, you'd probably see a tiger about once. So they were just not on view. You know, we sort of almost stopped mentioning them on guided tours because they just weren't visible to the public. They weren't aware that they were there. There's also a lack of breeding facilities, which speaks for itself, of course, given the, um, the conservation status of the tigers. There was also little education opportunity. So, sorry, slow down. I was trying so hard. <laughs> um, so there was also a lack of education opportunity. So there was no chance for signage. We could offer a guidebook to our guests, but this was an additional cost. And we do have an app, but that is downloaded by about 15% um, of our guests. And also, it's not actually an ideal habitat for the tigers. So this is not to necessarily show the tigers, but just to show you how open the exhibit was. And you can see as well from here, there is a clump of trees in the middle, which the tigers used to hide behind, but there wasn't any water access, there wasn't a lot of coverage for it, so they weren't terribly happy there. So when we decided to build a new exhibit, we needed to consider a number of things. I won't go through all of these. The first thing that we wanted to consider was our, um, was our brand proposition, which is truly wild encounters. And this is the idea that because we're a safari park, every time you go around, the experience should be completely different and completely exciting. Actually, the old tiger enclosure, it was completely the same and completely boring. So we needed to make sure that we did something different. The other thing that was important to us was as well to look at our um, guests. We have guests which are predominantly families, and the vast majority want primarily a good day out. They want to have some fun. But about half of them as well have also said to us that they do want to learn something as well. So that was really important. So this is from um, our interpretation plan when we sat down to put it together. So it was actually education and marketing who worked together on this as communication specialists. And the thing that was really important and something that I was really important to get across to marketing was although that we wanted to teach people facts and information about the tigers, actually an emotional experience and a positive feeling out of the tiger trail was something that was really, really important because we were hoping they would then feel more connected to the tigers, the tiger trail, Nosley itself, and a little bit like uh, Steve was talking this morning, thinking about creating those positive memories. So this was written into our interpretation plan. This is the kind of thing that we wanted people to say. We also realized that tigers are quite elusive. They are quite difficult to see, even given a new enclosure. So we wanted to create an experience that was really active, that was based on play and based on discovery. So actually, visiting the exhibit was so good, it didn't really matter whether you saw a tiger or not, Okay, which is perhaps quite a, quite a bold statement. So here are some of the things that we did, quite simple. So this is a wobbly bridge. I'm sure you've all been on a wobbly bridge. Um, it is incredibly wobbly and a little bit scary and you can't walk across it without laughing or having lots of fun. So this instantly at the start of the trail started creating that good experience. We also had <laughs> some of these are our education team. We also had simple features like this. So rather than just a static sign, we had opportunities for people to stop and take that family photo and have a little bit of fun. And then more traditionally, we had these, which are researcher notes. So if people wanted to read the more traditional interpretation, they could go around and they could um, fill these in. Another thing that was really important to us um, in terms of education was supporting live interpretation. In one of the very first meetings we had about it, um, my director said, what do you want, Nikki? Expecting I was perhaps going to come out with some quite sophisticated answers. And I said things like, I want storage, I want a platform for my presenters, and I want a decent space for them to be able to engage with the audience. We can do the rest. So this is actually our, old, um, our current Meerkat exhibit, which is not so inspiring, and actually sort of works against the live interpretation that we're trying to offer. 
This is the new or part of the new tiger exhibit. I've chosen the worst possible photograph because on the left is the stage that we built and my educator's not actually on the stage. <laughs> but you know, never mind. Um, the stage does actually have some inbuilt storage. We've got an inbuilt microphone area and we've got a natural seating area for people to sit and enjoy the engagement rather than sort of stood around, not really know what's going on and who's doing the delivery. We also had a classroom built into the enclosure as well. So this is our fourth teaching space, but the first one which is outside or sort of semi-outside. It's, it's got a roof. I did want to have um, some coverage. The other three classrooms that we have are all indoors. And again, there's not much else to it because as educators, I knew we could do the rest, but we needed that facility there. And then the other thing as well was supporting more of the factual content was about providing support for the walking tours which our team delivered to school groups. So one of the points we wanted to get across was that um, we have Amor tigers. They're not an animal that lives in the jungle. So rather than the educator gathering the children together and saying, right, we're going to Amor, pretend we're going, there is now a massive great sign that they can use as a point. The one on the right is actually a train station and they can take the children through this and get them really feeling like they're going on a journey. So we are still using our imagination and our creativity, but there's inbuilt features into the enclosure which just support that a little bit more. Another example of this is also talking about logging. We've got the visuals. Again, the children don't have to use all of their imagination. They can use the exhibit as well. Oh, and some evaluation. I was hoping I've got time to get this in. So we did do some evaluation. So um, pre and post surveys in autumn last year, I don't think you can probably see the bottom one, but it says 93% of those surveyed has a positive experience. Hurrah. So definitely we've met that. Interestingly enough, the graph on the left hand side. So we all know it's quite difficult to sort of gauge whether people have had an, emo uh, an emotional response. <laughs> an emotional response to the exhibit. So we basically asked people, what three things come to mind when you think of tigers? And our research team thought that would be a good gauge of sort of seeing how people answered. Interestingly enough, people gave more emotive answers before than after, after the emotional kind of answers went down. But interestingly, the, um, the answers that they gave relating to conservation and whether the animals were endangered went up. So we had a good outcome. It just wasn't necessarily the outcome that we were um, looking for in the first place. And I've got an owl, so I'm going to have to be quiet now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. Uh, next speaker, Theresa. Okay, so I'm Teresa Pina from Oceanarius Lisboa, working with Oceana Azul Foundation also. And, uh, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this proje project, that there was a problem, a big problem in Rio Formosa Lagoon. And once it had the highest density of seahorses. And now, due to habitat degradation and illegal capture, is almost extinct, the two species that live in that lagoon. So we, there, there has to be a solution, and the solution is to engage all the stakeholders to eliminate the threats, to change behavior, behaviors, and to save the future of the seahorses. So Oceano Azul Foundation identified or acknowledged this problem and decided to make a, an awareness campaign, communication campaign, with several areas of action, namely political, with fishermen, with uh, local communities and with students. Once again, to raise awareness about the importance of this heritage, the current status of the populations and why they are declining. So we decided to make an outreach educational program under this campaign to reach uh, children from five to nine years old. And in fact, we reached 9,000 students from 100 schools. We did it this between April and June last year, and in these muni municipalities that are really near the lagoon. So people that are probably more aware of what happens in the lagoon. 
How did we do it? We had this educational session in the schools for free, and a marine edu educator would go one and a half hour, more or less, to the, to the school, and would explain why he was there, what was the problem, and why we had to talk about it. And we used this book that I will explain later on to be the base of the session. Uh, also, we did some hands-on activities about the biology, the habitat, and in the end, a sum up and a reflection and a debate with the older kids. Well, we wanted to foster positive attitudes and values, and I did change this because in the beginning I had behavior change, and well, from what I learned in the first day, we wanted positive attitudes and value at these ages at least, because they can, cannot change behavior yet about this subject. We want to raise awareness about the, the urgency to take care of sea horses so that they can recognize possible causes and to increase the knowledge of its, their biology overall. And this is really important, to influence children so that, they so that they can influence their parents or their grandparents to be supportive for species conservation. So why did we use storytelling? Because it's an easy way to convey difficult information or complex information because it affects how people think about the species and the environment and because it promotes enjoyment and inspiration and creativity and we know that influences behaviors. So we had a, a well, not a very famous, but a children's writer and illustrator to do the book. We gave what, well, a briefing of what we wanted to get into the book. And we thought that this was an excellent opportunity to amplify the message because this is an offer, this is offered to the kids and they take it home and most probably they will ask their par parents to read it to them. So we have more two people engaged in it, and maybe the grandparents, and maybe the brothers and the sisters. So we, we also approach the, the reader or the listener, if they can read or not, to the reality. We didn't, uh, we used a seahorse, but not a humanized one. So the problem is real. And the, the main character was a child, so we can create emotional bonds and engagement, and maybe the kids can be motivated to act in the same way. So these are some photos of the, the classes and the activities, the ends on activities, and they are quite interested. This is about reproduction, for example, and they were really happy when they received the book, and immediately they had their name on it. And also there is a, um, a game that I can show you afterwards, like a glory game to with questions about seahorses. So the students made lots of campaigns, posters and stories. We made uh, evaluation, like a feedback evaluation. Not many teachers answered, but they said that the book was very useful and so did the parents and also told us that the, the children shared what they learned at home. These are some of the words we received, and you can see attitudes and values here. We didn't make, um, well, an, an evaluation, a qualitative evaluation, but we looked at it, and we can see that they have feelings for sea horses and that they have changed something. They want to do something, and this says that we can do something different with sea horses, and we want to act. So some final remarks. Stories are universal and uniquely to human. They bring people together and you can have people from different ages talking about the same issue. And well, also, uh, well, yeah, sorry, my time, the howl is coming. <laughs> they give context to, to information and they make people or children think what is their role in this problem. And they can influence people to change their attitudes and values because they understand what the story means. And we know that emotions impact on decision making. So these emotional stories can inspire action. And that's what we have seen, at least at these ages, what they can do. And I still have some time. Yeah? yeah. So I can just 
tell you the story that is a boy that receives a dry seahorse on his birthday and he cannot understand why can this give him luck. So he decided decides to be a sheriff in the Rio Formosa Lagoon and change the mind of fishermen and people that are illegally capturing this species. And in the end, he can do it and is like the hero of the story. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Cass. Welcome. Two, oh, sorry. <laughs> Do we have, are there two microphones? Or we can yep. just pass it back and forth, either one. Uh, so hi everyone, my name's Cass and this is Kayla. And we're here today from Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, Lone Pine opened in 1927 as a refuge for sick, injured and wild koalas and is now home to around 100 species of Australian native animals, including all of these guys. Um, Lone Pine's uh, education department facilitates around 20 specialty programs, including curriculum-linked school programs. And throughout all of these, Lone Pine's wildlife education officers incorporate age-appropriate narrative tools to influence attitudes and knowledge. Like many of you, we use storytelling in our education programs as it allows educators to convey complex topics by taking these often overwhelming... Oops, sorry often overwhelming and abstract issues and making them relevant on a personal level. Uh, Kayla and I are gonna show you how we use the power of storytelling during one of our programs called Guardians of the Endangered. Guardians demonstrates a way uh, in which storytelling can be utilized to engage young minds for conservation by having students become the storytellers. We have often found that when we allow students to become the teachers, the outcomes are often creative, empowering and effective. The benefits of peer-to-peer -peer teaching are well known and have been dubbed by scientists as the protege effect. Our research has found that we learn information better when we have um, the intention to teach to others rather than when we're just learning it for ourselves. And we've found that combining the power of storytelling with the benefits of peer-to-peer -peer teaching makes for an effective and engaging program and allows us to successfully cover a range of abstract concepts. So, Guardians begins with uh, introducing the students to three native species that have already gone extinct. So they learn about the lesser bilby, the Mount Glorious day frog, and probably most well known, the Tasmanian tiger. After we have this discussion, we then introduce uh, the concept of threatened species, focusing on the well known case of the Tasmanian devil, which is currently being affected by a disease called devil facial tumor disease. Uh, after this discussion, the students are then broken into groups or little teams, and each team is given a bag of clues that point to one threatening process. So we've got um, urbanization, wildlife trafficking, of illegal wildlife trade, uh, uh, introduced species, and global warming, climate change. Uh, after the students have had some time to work through their clue bags as a team, we then set them with another challenge. They then need to teach the rest of the class what they've learned. We leave this up to them to decide how they want to do this. So we've had uh, a lot of students do skits. That seems to be a popular choice, which is always creative and very entertaining. We've also had uh, students come up with songs in the past, which is interesting, <laughs> but very, very cool. Um, so we've had students act out being like a, a group of invasive species, coming in and pushing the native animals out of their habitat. We've also had students act out being smugglers, trying to sneak eggs through the airport security and getting busted, which is always good. Uh, <laughs> after this, we also ask the students to, very importantly, come up with one or two little actions that they can take or ways that, that they can help. Uh, the students then get to meet uh, an animal that's being impacted by each of the threats. And we find this is very useful. It kind of takes those abstract ideas and brings them more to reality. So they can talk about how urbanization is impacting wildlife, but then to be able to meet a koala and find out that 80% of the potential koala habitat in the Brisbane region where they live has already been cleared for development really makes it a reality for them. And we want students to not only learn about threats facing wildlife, but to understand the concepts to be able to teach their peers and think critically about real life solutions. We want to empower the students to understand their place in the natural world and act 
as guardians for wildlife through their actions. Simply telling students how and why wildlife is under threat is a one directional communication and doesn't offer any space for creative thought or deductive reasoning. This format allows students to think creatively and share the subject in a way that resonates with them, thus granting us as educators uh, insight into how the students have interpreted the subject. Sometimes this results in a little bit of a simplification of the topic, but for something as complex as climate change or urbanisation, maybe this isn't such a bad idea. Uh, we can try to teach these issues in a way that we think will be easiest for the children uh, to understand, but how do we really know? By implementing peer-to-peer -peer education, we're essentially removing that adult filter and allowing the students to teach the topics in a way that makes sense to them. Our ultimate goal is a two-part goal. For the students to understand the threats facing wildlife, and perhaps most importantly, to understand their power to change the future. When we ask them to come up with actions, we don't ask for massive unattainable solutions, but for one or two simple things that each person can do in their daily lives. The solutions need to be relevant to the students to empower and not overwhelm. So, as we all know, uh, teaching children about the overwhelming and sometimes very daunting threats facing our planet can be a big task for us as educators, especially when we only have a, a short window of time to try to achieve this. Sometimes it can feel like you're walking on a tightrope and you want to be impactful, but you don't want to be overwhelming. The last thing you want to do is to have students disengage or become jaded and think that there's nothing that they can do to help. So through Guardians, we've found that sometimes it's helpful to resist the urge to be behind the wheel and take a bit of a back seat to let the students drive the conversation and let their voices be heard. Um, children are, after all, the future of this planet. Uh, they do have a voice. Their voice is very valid. And we as adults have a responsibility not only to teach, but also, of course, to know when to sit back and listen. So moving forward with this program, something that we really want to focus on is evaluation, one of the reasons we wanted to come here. <laughs> um, so we're really excited to take everything that we've learned from this past week, get back to work, um, get, some, get some data to find out if what we think is working which we feel like is working, but we know that that doesn't mean much without data to back it up. So we're very excited to do that. And thank you guys all for a wonderful week. Thank you so much, uh, Cass and Kayla. Uh, the next speaker, Martina. Hello everyone. In my short presentation, I will show you pictures before the renewal and after the renewal of the new information system in our old nocturnal house and give some comments. As you will see in the exhibition I will show you, in our nocturnal house we provide a lot of biological facts. We all hope that the understanding of and fascination for animals is rising with knowledge, uh, is rising with knowledge about behavior and biology. We all hope that fascination could be a beginning of becoming an environmentalist. But of course, we know this is not enough. And in addition, we have to bring people in action to save nature. As you know, the evolution of the zoo concept should go from the zoological park in the 20th century to the conservation center in the 21st century. But I cannot automatically see a progress or evolution of knowledge among our visitors at the same uh, timeline. I think we always start again and again and again to teach basic knowledge to fascinate people. The nocturnal house in Frankfurt Zoo called Jimek House opened 1978 and is still one of the biggest in Europe. We have 44 enclosures, 20 enclosures for diurnal animals and 24 enclosures for nocturnal animals. The construction, as you can see here, is very clever because the path through the house is spiral and this saves a lot of place. 1978, we kept nearly 50 species inside the house. With the development of knowledge and the change of animal management, we reduced the number to 38 species. We reduced, for example, servals, caracals, wolves and black-footed cat. Can you imagine such big animals in such a small house? 
Today we keep 18 diurnal and 20 nocturnal species in this house. As you can see here, these are some highlights uh, from our collection and most of them are breeding. As head of education in Frankfurt Zoo, I'm responsible for the concept and the development of all information systems in the zoo. The challenge for me was for the renewal of the information system, we could not change the existing structure of the building. Therefore, we had limited space, we have li limited money, of course, and of course, it's dark inside in, in the nocturnal part, and we don't want to destroy the atmosphere through bright lightened panels. In 1978, the zoo designed very cleverly, I think, two totally similar enclosures just beside in, uh, each other uh, in the entrance of this house. But both showed the day situation before the renewal. Therefore, visitors saw diurnal animals in one enclosure on the left side and no nocturnal animals in the other one because, of course, they were sleeping mostly in, uh, behind the scenes. Visitors did not understand this message. As you can see, you can see nothing. They only saw an empty enclosure. Therefore, we turned one enclosure into a night, and now visitors could see the same biotope with active diurnal animals on one side and at the same time active nocturnal animals on the other side. And they could understand that animals with different activity patterns could share one biotope. Between these enclosures, we explain in a short way the advantage of living nocturnal, and we explain also when in evolution and why animals started to live nocturnal. This topic, many more species in one biotope, of dif uh, because of different time patterns, we explain again a di different way. And this could be the start of explaining biodiversity. Looking through these bull eyes or scuttles, I don't know which one is the right word, visitors can see pictures of a South American rainforest at day and night. And the challenge for them is to find out, it's a little game, uh, which of these four animals you can see here lives nocturnal and which lives diurnal. The visitors can see a big screen looking through this uh, bull eyes and in that situation the South American rainforest and all diurnal animals South American ones we keep in our house. After some seconds, this picture turns to the night situation and visitors can recognize a change of the species which live in the, which are active in the night. And we also took only species we keep in our house. But not only tropical animals are nocturnal, of course. Also in Germany, we have a lot. Uh, and we give an example with a hedgehog that we explain this in another display. This is very interesting for children, what we can find out. Another topic is which sensors are important for nocturnal animals. There we show three different animated cartoons. It's new for a zoo and uh, for the three senses, for hearing, smelling and feeling. And for the sense seeing, we show pictures of a night monkey and uh, beside the skull with the big eye holes. Uh, typical for nocturnal animals, and this was really fascinating for a lot of people. For the animated film, we created uh, storyboards, and these were transformed into films. Here you can see some screenshots uh, at the end uh, I made. For hearing, visitors can observe an eye eye searching for a maggot, smelling an artwork searching termites, we have it here. <laughs> and touching a quendo using his vibrisses at the legs and the nose for orientation while moving through the branches. We also created new information signs showing proper behavior in a nocturnal house and we had a big discussion if we should li uh, do it like this. Uh, and uh, the third one is uh, we were pickpockets we because it's very dark in the house and we have a lot of problems with them, or had a lot of problems. Another topic is how works the Tapetum Vizudum. I know this is very special, but we have also people which are interested in, which is a part of the eye of most nocturnal animals. We compare the view of humans and cats and explain in an animated film the reflection of light ray on the Tapetum Lucidum and how it affects the optic nerves. Maybe as you, oh, sorry. As you know, um, the optic nerve is irrit irritated twice by the light, while the light ray is reflected by the tapetum lucidum. And therefore, the use of light is stronger 
this affects better view for most nocturnal animals. And all people know pictures of cats uh, with uh, glooming eyes, I think. Another topic is light pollution and the effect of insects, birds, and sea turtles. As an eye catcher, oh, now right direct, wrong direction, here it is. As an eye catcher, we show a little film uh, and visitors can observe hundreds of insects flying around the street light the whole day. Nearly 150 insects die in one summer night in on uh, under one of these street lights. Therefore, we show in a display, a, ca a display case, a collection of 150 um, insects from different species dying in one night. Um, and we all this we use also in guided tours to go deeper inside of this uh, um, informations. Um, two more, and then I'm ready. We speak about behavior enrichment in the nocturnal house. This was very um, necessary for the keepers. They spoke uh, uh, with me. I should speak about their work. And we show a little film showing enrichment activities. And at least we keep a group of uh, golden lime tamarinds, and we explain how zoos took part in returning them to wilderness. And it's a successful story, uh, Frankfurt Zoo, was involved in this program and we are very proud that some Frankfurt Lion Tamarine boys are founder of new families in the rainforest. That's it. And we, we uh, at least we replace the labels of the species. Thank you very much, Martina. Uh, next speaker, Klaus. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Klaas Jan Leinega from Beekse Bergen uh, Zoo, and I'm um, the manager of education and experiences. That's how we call it in, uh, in our zoo. And I'm going to talk about um, conservation education as an experience actually immersed in scenes. So I want to know are there some people from France? Please raise your hands. Okay, you have a lot of work to do. I think you failed in France. We have some French visitors last year. I will show you the movie. It's a joke, of course. Nee. Maybe you've seen it. Oh, 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 Fuck. You understand something? Oh, <laughs> In the auto, man. So come up. Oh, what the fuck? Jesus. 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 What the fuck? Well, okay. These were some French people. Of course, it was a joke. You do a fantastic job in the French shoes. But um, what's happening? Uh, that's too much experience, I think, for uh, the educational uh, message we uh, we want to tell. So what we do in our zoo. We have a safari park and uh, we, we give uh, guided tours in our safari buses. We do the same uh, guided tours on our safari boats, so you see the animals from, from the water side. We have, of course, panels. Uh, we have a lot of activities for guests like the canoe safari and the, um, the, um, uh, this picture. Uh, you can canoe and you see the rhinos from out of the water, they're really big. We have the entertainment teams, uh, also of the holiday parks uh, we have. And since last year we have the um, uh, resort, the safari resort. And we also do the education, education on the resort. So we have a ranger guide. So we want to uh, get the, um, to have the children go out of their lodge and um, discover our nature and do all things uh, which are in this book. And of course, we have a real African game drive. So this is the starting point. This is our um, area's 450 hectares. Safari park, the resort, and the holiday park, another holi uh, holiday park without animals. We have event center for big events and a uh, play area, uh, like an uh, attraction park, very small. So this is the starting point, so maybe now you know wha uh, where I work, because a lot of people, unfortunately, didn't visit Beeksebergen so far. So this is how it looks like when you are on the resort. Just a picture. Okay, what do we do? On the resort, we have to, uh, we want to um, uh, let the children um, uh, discover the nature and also discover the whole park. Uh, so we need education in the holiday park, in the safari resort. So what we did, we had a barbecue with my education team. It's about 60 people. We drink a few beers, only a few. And we 
We're uh, talking about uh, rhino poaching in Africa, and there was a method. They want to uh, catch poachers by drones, flying drones with uh, cameras um, registering heat. So you can see warmth. Um, you, you can see because of the warmth, you can see poachers walking, but also rangers walking and animals walking. And then uh, they want to try the to make the software that way that the software recognizes if it's a poacher or not. Of we, 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 we thought about it uh, during the barbecue, and the next day the designer came to me and said, oh, you remember the talk about yesterday? No, I didn't remember, but it slowly came up again. It was a fantastic plan, and we should make it. So we did it. We bought an old uh, Land Rover. It's uh, just in the middle of the resort, so it's only available for the resort guests. And uh, in the Jeep, there's um, uh, some um, a diary of the ranger. So actually, you are in the scene of a ranger uh, workplace. That's what, why, uh, what we want to do, uh, emerge in this scene. So we don't tell a lot of things about the poaching thing with signs, but just with a diary of the ranger and the pack list. And the packing list over there at the right, it says that the ranger received uh, the, the warmth, the camera for the warmth. And it's on this screen. On this screen, you can see not so flatsy, the animals. So this is the, the, the on the screen you can see it, uh, uh, what is warm of the animals. And what you can see, it's not, there's a giraffe in front of uh, a small, very small tent, but in a diary it says that there's a, a tent, somebody's in a tent in the middle of the savannah, but he's sleeping all day. And uh, during the night he's gone. So maybe it's a poacher. That's a story in the diary of the ranger. So what we do in the, um, in the pop, there's um, a, a the, the pop is make made warm by electricity. And at the evening, we put off the electricity, so slowly the pop uh, will get cold. So it's not visible anymore on the camera. So that's how we tell this story. And uh, in all these projects we do, we also have the connection to our uh, foundation of wildlife, so you can contribute to um, our foundation. And this is what we uh, continuously um, encounter when you uh, enter our zoo or our safari park or resort. The, 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 the name of the Wildlife Foundation, and so you can contribute by yourself, is um, repeating. We did the same, um, actually, uh, kind of the same. This is a restaurant, and the wall uh, underneath the restaurant is a the coltan mine. This is a close-up at the right. In the coltan mine, there's also uh, uh, coltan stones, and they light up. And um, this is in cl uh, next to our uh, uh, gorilla enclosure. And this is the Colta mine. In from this mine, you hear the sounds of um, uh, the mine workers. They're working uh, down there. You hear the sounds. So you emerge in the entrance of a Colta mine. So that's the scene you are in. And when you uh, enter this area, the there's uh, starting a Skype conversation with one of the rangers, and he's telling you upon oh what's happening in the mine, and he's uh, sending you pictures to the uh, cell phones over there. He, he, he sends you pictures so you can actually he tells a story against you. Um, through Skyping. So that's what we do. And he's calling for uh, bringing your mobile cell phone to the zoo to uh, uh, reuse it. And also you can uh, take an envelope, take it home. And there are a lot of shops in the Netherlands where you can just uh, bring the envelope with the mobile phone and the money goes to, um, to our foundation of wildlife. And so we can protect uh, wildlife again. And the telephone, the Coltan is reused. Actually, that's what we do. And of course, we need some uh, more text about it. So we have this uh, drawing about the um, the life cycle of Colton, how it's how it's working actually. So this is uh, two projects we did last year. Uh, we had another one, but the time is almost uh, gone. I see. So we had three uh, this kind of pro uh, projects um, where you are immersed in the scene of a workplace or a ranger or whatever. Uh, it's not telling the story by signs, but by the scene you are in. We didn't evaluate it uh, so far. We will, but we didn't uh, do it. We don't. We didn't have time of the. The um, it's, it's just brand new, so we will do it. I hope this year. So, <coughs> thank you very much. So you know, I'm the um, attractive uh, species, so you will see me around and look at me. Thank you.